this morning, I kind of wanted to start off with a question. How many of you guys like riding roller coasters? Raise your hand if you like riding roller coasters. Oh, man, that's just like uh, a little less than half. All right, now how many of you guys are the stroller sitters? The people that watch the stroller, hold the bag, hold the food. Raise your hand if you're afraid to ride roller coasters. <laughs> okay, so it's about even. We got about half that say, okay, I like, I like riding rides, and we have another half that are a little bit of afraid. But for me, I love roller coasters. Um, I, don't, I, I just can't understand if you're paying like, you know, almost $100 to go to Disneyland and you can't even get on one ride, right? Or if you spend like, what is it, $60 now at Six Flags? And all you're going to do is just look at the animals. I don't know, to me, that's not getting your money's worth. For me, I love getting on every single ride as possible. And the funny thing was, I used to be terrified of roller coasters. Like, I would... I wouldn't even get on the Cobra ride at um, Six Flags. You guys know that the little kitty one that just goes up? <laughs> I know some of you guys are afraid of that because I've been to Six Flags with you guys. You couldn't even get on it. But I used to be afraid. I was terrified of roller coasters. And this one day I was just like, okay, you know what? I, I'm, I'm not really, there's not really a health issue, right? I'm, there's nothing like, I'm not going to have something happen to me physically if I ride the roller coaster. I'm just afraid. And for many of us, why are we afraid to ride roller coasters? Why are you guys afraid to ride roller coasters? <laughs> okay, so some of you guys, you're afraid of what? Flying off. You're afraid of it, you know, looping, and then you get stuck. And I've seen that happen before, and it, you know, I wouldn't want to be on that. But, you know, you're afraid it's going to get stuck. You're afraid your seatbelt's going to come off, and you're going to fly off or something, right? So some of us, you know... I, I don't doubt some of you guys have some health problems that keep you from riding a roller coaster. That's different. But for most of us, we're just afraid, right? Would you guys admit that? Most of us were just afraid. Like for me, I had no reason. And so I was just afraid. And so one day I was just like, we went to Six Flags and I was just like, okay, you know what? I just have to get over this. I'm just going to get on Medusa. And if you know Medusa, it's that giant green one at Six Flags, right? The, I think it's the biggest one they have at the, the park, but I was just like, okay, I got to get over my fear. I just got to do it. So I went in there, and then, you know, I was like, I just forced myself. I strapped myself in the seat, and then if you ever go on that ride, it starts climbing and climbing and climbing and climbing, and you're just like, oh, what did I do? Like, stop the ride. Get me off of it, right? And, you know, it just went, and I was just like, wow, you know? Like, there's nothing of, like, riding a roller coaster and feeling that adrenaline. Like, if you guys love roller coasters, you know that feeling, right? The minute it drops, you're just like, woo! And then you're just going, and you're just like, woo, I want to do that again. And, you know, I, I wouldn't have experienced, you know, riding a roller coaster or anything like that if I just, what, was afraid. And the point I'm trying to make here is that fear keeps us, fear holds us back sometimes, right? Fear has this kind of power or this ability that it, we, you know, when we let fear into our lives, it holds us back. And so for many of you guys, you guys are afraid. You have fear within you, so you go, you're never going to be able to experience Medusa. You're never going to experience Tower of Terror. I know some of you guys love, oh, I know they changed it, but it's kind of the same ride, I guess. But, you know, you're never going to experience all of these, you know, riding Medusa, riding California screaming, Tower of Terror because of Fear, and most of the times, there's nothing to be afraid of, right? I looked up the statistics. There's a 1 in 24 million chance of you getting injured on a roller coaster or something happening. So that's a very small chance, right? So if you think about the statistics, you know, is there really a reason, uh, putting aside the health issues and all of that stuff, is there really a reason for us, for those of you guys who are afraid, is there a reason for you to be afraid of riding a roller coaster? Not so much, right? It's just all in your mind. It's all in your head. You're allowing fear to hold you back from that. And, you know, we find ourselves afraid and fearing things that we shouldn't be afraid of. It's called irrational fears, right? And I know many of you guys, we, we all have irrational fears. One of them is spiders. Who's afraid of spiders? <laughs> I know sometimes we'll be here at church and there'll just be this small little spider that's like up in the ceiling, in the corner, and then I'll hear, like, the youth, like, screaming, like, ah! And I'll go over there, and I said, what are you guys screaming about? And there's this little spider that's in the corner, and it's not, like, running after them. It's not shooting anything or jumping on them. It's just up there in the corner, right? Another one is, is rats or mice. How many of you guys get afraid of rats and mice? I'll, I'll admit, I, I get 
kind of freaked out when I see mice, especially here in church. <laughs> especially when I come here alone. Sometimes I'll open up the church, turn on the lights, and I'll just see this thing run past me, and I'll just like, ah, <laughs> like jump up. The youth know I'm afraid of birds, too. There was a bird that was stuck in the kitchen during the week, and when I opened it, it just started flying around, and I screamed, and I closed it. But there's a lot of things that we are afraid of. And so, you know, thinking about the roller coasters, but also going on to, you know, like spiders, um, mice. Some of us are afraid of the dark snakes. Right? We, we're afraid of all of these things, but when you really think about it, and I know like spiders can injure you or snakes can, you know, attack you, but most of the times these animals, they run away from us, right? I've never experienced a spider that runs after me or chases me or a snake that comes after me. I know they're dangerous, but the point is most of the time when you really think about our fears for these things, is there really a reason for us to be afraid? No. I mean, unless the spider is like the size of us or, you know, it's giant or like big or it's running after us, attacking, there's no reason for us to be afraid of these things. It's irrational fears. And what is it that, and why do we allow ourselves to be afraid? Why do we allow fear into us? And because of that, fear takes over our minds, it takes over, you know, our actions and it holds us back and it keeps us away from doing things, right? And so... This morning, we're going to be looking at a story about fear and how powerful fear is and how fear kept a group of people back when they had no reason to be afraid. So if you can open up your uh, Bibles to Numbers chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. And um, bear with me, it's kind of a long passage, but uh, we're just going to go ahead and read right through it. So we're going to go into Numbers chapter 13, and we're going to start off with verses 1 through 3. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran. All of them were leaders of the Israelites. So we're going to skip um, all the way down to verses 17. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev and go into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees on it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as, I might pronounce, mispronounce this, <laughs> Rehob, <laughs> toward Levo Hamath. They went up through the Negev and came to Hebron where, <laughs> sorry, I, don't, I might pronounce, mispronounce this, but it's okay, Ahim, Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, lived there. Hebron had, oh, okay. Hebron had been built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. When they reached the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them on it, two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. And at the end of the 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. And I believe that's... Yes, okay. Let's go ahead and pray before we continue. Father God, we just come before you this morning and we just... We just thank you, Lord, for just your goodness and your love for us, God. God, I just pray that your spirit will just speak to us, that your words will speak, not, in, not my own, God. God, I just pray that you just open up our hearts and open up our ears. And just help us to just be in tune with what you have for us this morning, God. God, we just give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. And we give you all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So real quick, before we keep on reading, the Israelites had just reached the promised land, right? So this is roughly a year or two after God had set them free from slavery in Egypt. And they had reached the doorstep of the promised land. They're right, right on the border. They didn't step in yet. And God commanded Moses to send in 12, 
12, tri uh, 12 spies, excuse me, to go into the land and explore it. So if you saw through the instructions, Moses was like, okay, well, see what kind of people live there, what the towns are like, um, you know, what the soil is like, just everything, right? Just go in there, give us a report of what's going on, what the land looks like, and just come back to us after 40 days. And we're going to continue with um, verses 25 to 31. At the end of the 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community of Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of I'm going to say it like Filipino, but I'm not there. <laughs> the Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites, and the Parasites and the <laughs> live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the man who had gone up with him said, uh, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. Okay, yeah, that was it. <laughs> yeah, so you see here when they come back and they return with this report. So they went in there and they're like, Moses, this place is amazing, right? God has brought us into this promised land. And it's, you know, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Look at how big the fruits are. I mean... Can you guys imagine just some grapes so big that two people had to carry them? And, you know, they were just like, yeah, this land is just so great. It's so amazing. It's truly what God had promised us. And, you know, this is really a place where we can live, where we can prosper. But, well, you know, we were in there and we saw the people that live there. And, you know, they're like Shaquille O'Neal. They're like seven foot something. They're tall. They're muscular. They're so much bigger than we are. And, uh, you know, I just don't know if we can do it. And if you think about that, right, think about the Israelites had just been in captivity. They had been enslaved for hundreds of years. God had just freed them. He had brought them through the wilderness. He split the Red Sea. He, he did all of these miracles and all the plagues just so that they could get out of Egypt to bring them to this land where they would live, the land where they would prosper and grow. They're right there on the border. They're looking in. And all they had to do was what? Right? All they had to do was step in and the land would be theirs. Yes, there was people already living there. Yes, there was all of those Canaanites, ites, and all those other people that lived there. But God already promised them that land. And to think that, you know, after hundreds of years of slavery and all of those years, uh, you know, a couple of years wandering through the desert, wandering through the wilderness, to finally see the place where they were meant to be. And then all of a sudden, well, yeah, it is a nice place, and, you know, we're glad, but uh, you know, there's just no way. You know, those people are so much bigger than we are. And, you know, if you keep reading down, they're like, oh, we look like grasshoppers to them. They're just stronger. They're giants. No thanks. No thanks. It, it's fine. We're, we're, we just, yeah, it's nice and lovely, God, but uh, it's okay. I mean, just think about that for a second. You know. When we're looking forward to something within our lives, looking forward to something great and it's right before us, how many of us would just be like, eh, it's all right, God, I'm, I'm fine? No, right? Every time I read this story, I'm just like, oh, you're right there. <laughs> all you had to do was go into the, step into the promised land. And I'm going to read from verse 31, and this is the NLT. It says, but the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. And so what happened? The Israelites knew that, 
okay, in order for us to fully inherit the promised land, we're going to have to go up against these people, right? We're going to have to go up against all of those ites. But they're so much stronger. They're so much bigger than we are. And, uh, you know, I'm afraid. I don't want to do it. And so what happened here was fear held them back. Fear kept them from going into the land that God had already promised them. And so you guys kind of see this picture of how powerful, and, you know, this ability that fear has when we allow it into our minds, when we allow fear to take over us. And so I have three points here about what did the fear do to the Israelites? What does fear and what did fear do to the Israelites? The first point is that fear keeps us comfortable. Fear keeps us comfortable. Now looking out into the crowd, some of you guys look a little bit uncomfortable because you guys are sitting in a place that you didn't want to sit, right? You know, we, we try to move it around and, you know, have everyone sit in the front. And, you know, sometimes, you know, be honest, we're all comfortable when we come to church, right? Okay, this is my seat. That's my parking spot. This is where I want to be. And so... Going into the promised land would have required the Israelites to step out of their comfort zone. So when they would go into the Israelites, they were going into a place that they were not familiar with, that they didn't know, they haven't seen before, and they were going to go up against these, you know, Shaquille O'Neal, seven-foot, muscular, tall guys, and, you know, when they're thinking about it, they're like, okay, well, you know, we're smaller than they are. And we're going to have to go up against them. We're going to have to, you know, fight against them. And, you know, many of us are going to die. We're going to get wounded. We're going to get kidnapped. All of this bad stuff is going to happen to us, right? And so they're like, yeah, I, I'm just not comfortable with that. And if you look at their reactions, many of them were like, okay, you know what? Let's just stay here in the wilderness. And some of them were even willing to go back into Egypt. They were willing to go back to the land where they were enslaved, where they were, you know, in bondage. That's how powerful fear, that's how comfortable they were over there. And they didn't even want to step forward because they're like, you know what, it, we're going to be in an uncomfortable situation. We're going to get killed. We're going to get slaughtered. Some of us might get hurt and all of this. And so what happened? They stayed within their comfort zone. Moving forward would have brought them in into an uncomfortable situation. So they opted for what they were used to and they chose to remain where they were comfortable. But God's plan wasn't for them to be comfortable. God's plan wasn't for them to wander around in the wilderness for another 40 years. God's plan wasn't for them to go back to Israel and live there. No. God was calling them into greater things. God was calling them to step into the promised land, the land where they were going to grow as a people, where they were going to prosper, where they were going to reap all of the benefits of everything that God had for them. That was the, God's will. But they chose to be comfortable. And in our lives, sometimes God places us into uncomfortable situations, right? How many of you guys, how many of you guys like to stay in an, in an uncomfortable situation? Not, not many of us, right? Many of us don't want to be the third wheel on a date or be at the, our friend's house when they're getting scolded by their parents, right? We just don't like uncomfortable situations. But when God places us into an uncomfortable situation, it usually means that there's something greater on the other side. When God places us into an uncomfortable situation, it usually means that he's trying to build us up, that he's putting us through this because we're going to come out stronger, or that there's something that he has for us that's promised to us that's greater than what we have now is on the other side of that uncomfortable situation. When we're put into an uncomfortable situation, it forces us to move. It forces us to want to get out of it, right? Nobody likes staying, like I said, nobody likes remaining in a place where you're uncomfortable. So when we're placed there, God puts us there because he knows that, you know what, they don't want to be there, so they're going to have to move. And you see, when we're comfortable, we have no incentive to trust in God. When we're comfortable, we're relying on ourselves, we're relying on our own abilities, but when we're God places us into an uncomfortable situation, it gives us a reason, it gives us an incentive to trust in him and trust in his strength. And so the question is, yes, 
being in an uncomfortable situation forces us to move. But are you going to move forward into what go? <laughs> to what God has the other side, on the other side of you? Or are you going to step back into the wilderness? Or are you going to step back to Egypt? See, too often we choose comfort at our own expense. When we choose comfort, it, it holds us back from experiencing the greater things that God has for us. Being comfortable does more damage than good when it comes to our walk with God. You see, because when you become comfortable, you become content, right? And when you become content, you become stagnant. And what does stagnant mean? It's just no movement, right? When you see a pool of water that's been stagnant, it's usually, what, green and dirty because there's no movement of the water. And so that's what happens when we become comfortable. We become content, and we come, become content, we become stagnant. And when we become stagnant, there's no growth. And you're stuck there, right? So nothing great comes out of being comfortable. You guys agree with that, church? Now, can you imagine if any of the 12 disciples, if, if, if Peter or any of them were just comfortable, like, you know, God called them to, you know, follow him. If they were like, no, thanks, I'm just comfortable here, you know, fishing or being a tax collector or being a doctor. None of those things that we read about in the Bible would have happened if Moses was comfortable with where he was living as a prince of Egypt, the Israelites. None of that would have happened. Paul, if he was just being comfortable being, you know, what he was, being an official, all of these things would not have happened. And it's like that within our lives, right? Nothing great or nothing gets done when we are comfortable. One of, my, uh, one of the good um, examples of that is Working out, right? How many of you guys have a goal of, God, oh, you know, I'm going to lose five pounds or I'm going to build up this muscle mass, right? You know, we set these goals and we're like, yeah, okay, you know, that's where I want to be. But then if we're just sitting on our couch, on our phone, and we're comfortable there, are you going to get a nice toned body? Are you going to get a six-pack? Are you going to get a, you know, biceps? No. Because you're comfortable. If you're not comfortable, then you, none of those things are going to happen to you. So as Christians, we can't be comfortable or satisfied with where we are. We must keep moving forward. We can't step into greater things that God has for us when we're comfortable. Now look to your neighbor and tell them, don't get comfortable. And if they look a little bit comfortable, make them uncomfortable. <laughs> Give them a shake or something. You know? <laughs> Second point, first point was what? Fear keeps us comfortable. The second point is fear keeps us defeated. Fear keeps us defeated. Now, it was called the promised land, right? Now, why was it called the promised land? Why did they refer to it? Why did they call it the promised land? Because it was already promised, right? It wasn't called, okay, maybe if God gives it to us and finds favor for us, it will be our land, right? Or maybe if we muster up enough courage, then it's our land. No, it was called the promised land. And we know that when God promises something, it comes to light, right? It, it comes to fruition. One of my favorite verses, Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. It was a little bit different. But let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who has promised is faithful. And so the Israelites, they had experienced God's faithfulness, you know, all, through all of those years, throughout the Exodus. You know, they experienced God sending the plagues. They experienced God providing manna and all of that for them while they were wandering in the wilderness. So they knew that God kept his promises. And because God already promised it to them, no matter what stood in their way or who stood in their way, that land was already theirs. And can you put up Numbers chapter 13, verse 2? And re look at this, all right? Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites, which I am. Remember that. I am giving to the Israelites. So God already said it right there, right? He already told them, I am giving you this land. 
And so they knew that God was, would be with them, that they knew no matter what they faced, no matter who they come, came across, it was already theirs. No matter how tall or how big the people that they would go up against, God was like, you know what, don't worry about them. I got you. This is yours. And it kind of reminds me of one of my favorite movies going up was Space Jam. You guys watch Space Jam? So, <laughs> so if you know in Space Jam, you know, it's the, the Looney Tunes and they go up against these. <laughs> I'll give a quick recap for Brother Al. <laughs> but <laughs> I was like, how could you know this? But the aliens, you know, they come here on Earth and they, they take the power away from, you know, like Patrick Ewing and all those stars of the NBA from the 90s. And then all of a sudden they grow into these big, massive, like, you know, monsters, right? That's what they called their team was the monsters. And then they were going up against, you know, the Toon Squad, which is like Daffy Duck, Bugs Bunny, and, you know, like they're small and everything like that. And so when I read this story, I was like, oh, it kind of reminds me of that because, you know, they're going up against these, you know, people that are bigger than them, just like in, in Space Jam. But, you know, in Space Jam, they, they had who on their team, though? Michael Jordan, right? So it kind of reminds me of, of us. You see, a lot of us, we're taking losses every single day. Everyone put up a, make an L with your hand. <laughs> right? Make up an L. So if you ever see your kids doing this, it means like, you know, someone took the L, someone take the loss, right? <laughs> I know our youth love doing that, but the L. See, many of us are taking L's every single day. The Israelites took an L, and you think about this, before they even tried. The Israelites didn't even step into the promised land, and they already took the loss. They didn't even pick up their swords yet. They didn't even pack up. The, they, they didn't even set foot into the promised land, and they already were defeated. It's like, you know, in basketball, if you didn't even, you don't even step onto the basketball court, and you're like, okay, well, you know, we're going up against Who? All right, you know, that's it. We're, you know, that, no thanks. We'll, we'll take the loss. But the thing that we need to remember is that we already have the victory. The Israelites forgot that. The minute they saw the giants ahead of them, they're like, oh, uh, okay, we'll, we'll just forfeit. No. Church, we have the victory. The Israelites already had that land promised to them. They already knew that they would win no matter what battles they were going to face. They knew already that God would see them through it. Yet they forgot that. And we are forgetting that every day of our lives. When situations and when battles come before us, we take L's, right? We take the L's daily because we're like, oh, yeah, yeah I just don't want to do it. And, you know, in Space Jam, right, they had Michael Jordan on their team. They had the GOAT, right? You guys you know what the GOAT stands for? <laughs> if you ever heard that, I mean, people are like, oh, he's the GOAT, the GOAT, GOAT. GOAT means greatest of all time, right? So that's what they mean. But, the, you know, in, in, if you think about it, in Looney Tunes or in Space Jam, they had Michael Jordan. They had the GOAT on their side. So how were they going to lose when they had Michael Jordan on their team? And how are we going to lose, church, when we have the G-O-D on our team? Are you hearing me, church? Are you hearing me, church? How are we going to lose when we have God on our side? You see, fear has this ability to make us admit defeat before we even try. We have the victory because we already have God on our side. So stop taking L's. Turn to your neighbor and say, stop taking L's. You already have the victory. <laughs> I, I think James got the most satisfaction out of that. <laughs> Tell you there, stop taking L's. You already have the victory. You have God on your side. Amen. There's nothing for us to fear. Don't take the loss before you even set foot into the promised land, before you even try. Amen. One more point. So fear keeps us comfortable. Fear keeps us defeated. And the last point is fear keeps us enslaved. Fear keeps us enslaved. So as you guys know, the Israelites had been slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years, right? And for 
400 years. And so you think about everything that they went through throughout those 400 years and what God had done for them by, you know, sending all the plagues so that Pharaoh would, um, you know, let his people go. Let my people go. You know, that's not, okay, never mind. <laughs> but, um, you know, God had split the Red Sea for them. Think about this. God did all of these things just so that he could free them from slavery and so that they could move into the promised land, which represented freedom. And so they were moving forward in freedom into a promised land in where th which they could live and they could prom uh, prosper. The promised land represented greater things for them. But the minute that they saw the opposition that they were going to go against, the minute they saw all of those ites that were <laughs> living in the land, and if you look at their reactions, some of them were willing to go back to Egypt. Now think about that. You, your people had just spent 400 years in slavery, being persecuted, being forced to work, you know, build all of these things and not being free, having shackles and chains on them. They spent 400 years. And here they are right before they step into the promised land, right before they step into freedom. And what did they do? They wanted to turn back. They wanted to run back to the bondage, bondages of slavery. Now, how many of you guys, if you have been, been set free, the prison doors have been opened, the chains have been taken off of you, and you are about to step into something greater, you are about to step into freedom, how many of you guys would run back to the chains? How many of you would run back to the prison door and close it behind you? Not many of us would want to do that, but that's what we are doing to ourselves when we allow fear into our minds. By giving into fear, we are allowing it to become our master. And when we allow fear to become our master, we are placing the chains back onto our hands, our shackles, to our feet, and we're closing that prison door right behind us. And when you think about it, you know, the Israelites weren't physically chained down. They, they physically didn't have chains in them, but it was their mindsets. It was their mentality that was enslaved. And they wanted to settle for, you know, being a slave again. They wanted to settle for something that wasn't great. They wanted to settle for something that was mediocre, if that's the right word. <laughs> they, they, they didn't want it. Fear kept them back from stepping into something greater. See, they, to them, Egypt represented slavery. It le represented a life of bondage. And it was the place that God didn't want them to be. God went through all of that trouble. He, he did all these miracles. He split the Red Sea. He did all of that just so that they could be free. He opened the prison doors. He took the chains off of them, yet they ran back to slavery. See, for the Israelites, you know, Egypt was what they were used to. Egypt was where they were from. And that's what happens to us when we become comfortable, when we allow fear to just enslave our minds. We just don't want to move forward. It holds us back. I mean, if I was to get chained down right here and I was trying to move forward, I wouldn't be able to, right? Because it was holding me back. And so Egypt might have been where they were from. It might have been what they were used to, but it wasn't where God meant for them to be. And so for many of us, we have allowed fear into our lives and it has chained us down. It has held us back from moving into what God wants us to do, moving into that place where God can use us to do greater things, moving us into a place where we can prosper, where God will just, you know, shower us with his freedom and his blessings. And we forget that, you know, God already set us free. How many of you guys are free in here, church? God has already set us free. We don't have any excuse not to move forward because just like the Israelites, God already did the hard part and setting us free. So we have no excuse anymore. The Israelites had zero excuse to go back to slavery because God already set them free. God already has made a way for us. He is calling us to move forward into freedom. He is calling us to move forward into the things that he has promised us. And we can't look back, church. The Israelites made that mistake by looking back. No, we have to look forward. 
We have to move on like Jessica preached last week. We have to keep moving forward. Don't go back to what was then. Don't go back to whatever was holding you back. Keep moving forward. Now look to your neighbor and say, shake those chains off. You can shake your hands. Yes, tell them, shake those chains off. Yeah, you, you can shake your body too if you want. <laughs> But as I close, I want you guys to just remember. When we look back into the story, you see that Israel was on the cusp of something greater. They were, they were just right there ready to just, you know, inherit everything that God had promised for them. But because of fear, they never got to experience it. Fear, right? You know, when you read the story, you just see how powerful fear is. But when we, looked, when we read the story, not all of the spies responded that way, right? As we know, there's 10 of them, I mean 12 of them, and 10 of them were giving a negative report, but two of them thought otherwise. If you put up Numbers 14, verse 6 through 9. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of, you can read that on your own, <laughs> who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes. And said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we pass through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. Only, only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us us do not be afraid of them so out of 12 of them only two of them were like put me in coach i'm ready we can do this right we can defeat these people we can go in there and conquer that land and so what was so different about these two what was so different about joshua and caleb is that they didn't respond with fear but they responded in faith they responded in faith and if you read it in other versions, I like reading in other versions, they were so eager. They were like, come on, let's do this. What are we doing? We're wasting time. We're already here. It's right before us. It's ours. Let's go now, now, now. And they're just like, the rest of them are like, ah, it's okay. That's how eager they were because they didn't focus on how big those giants were, but they focused on how big their God was. They didn't focus on the obstacles because they already knew that they already had the victory. They knew about God's promises. They knew about God's faithfulness. They experienced God's faithfulness daily. So they knew that whenever God says something, it would come true. And they knew that there was no reason to doubt their God. And so they were ready. They knew that no matter what came their way, no matter what stood in their way, God already gave them that victory. God already promised them that land, and so it was already there. And the worship team can go ahead and come up. And as I close out this sermon this morning, I, ask, I want us to ask ourselves, what is that promised land that is before you right now? Maybe God has called you into something greater. Maybe God is calling you to, you know, to, to leave where you are, leave your comfort zone, and to step into, you know, a great unknown where there's going to be a lot. You're going to fight battles. You're going to be stepping into a place that you're not too familiar with, you're not comfortable with. What is it, church? What is that promised land that is before you? Now, what stands in your way? What are the giants? Because like I said, you know, we we're going to have to fight battles every now and then. We're going to have to face opposition we're going to come across giants in our lives. But what is your reaction going to be? Are you going to be one of those ten and run away, take the L, go back to the bondages of slavery? Or are you going to have faith in our God and know that our God will see you through and that our God has already promised us that victory? What are you going to do, church? Are we going to step forward into that promised land or are we going to run back? to Egypt. You see, God didn't give us a spirit of fear. God 
call, is calling us to be brave. God is calling us to trust in Him. Be bold and courageous. Be strong and move forward. It's time that we stop giving our lives over into fear. It's time that we stop letting fear hold us back. It's time that we stop being comfortable. And it's time for us to move forward into the promised land that God has already promised to us. It's time to move into greater things. It's time for us to stop what we are comfortable with and just say, God, I'm going to trust in you. God, you are calling me to, to, you know, unknown parts. But, Lord, I know I already have the victory. I'm not going to focus on the giants ahead of me. I'm not going to focus on my opposition because I already know that my God is bigger than whatever giant might come my way. My God is bigger than whatever obstacle might come my way. God, you already made a way for me through the wilderness. You made a way for us through the desert, God. And we're just going to trust you. We're going to move forward in victory. We're going to move forward into freedom.